Right. To our dear friend, Mike Williams. Well, friends, it, it, it's wonderful to be here. I'm sorry, it took a bit of time to get up. <laughs> I've stopped getting older, and I've got older now, so <laughs> uh, it's a bit difficult. But what a wonderful year this has been. I mean, the Dad's Army, 50 years on, we've had postage stamps, we've had, uh, um, uh, what's his name, the, the pointless man, uh, Alexander Armstrong, uh, doing a, a, a wonderful uh, court, court uh, episode thing called Salute to Dad's Army. And uh, Ronnie and I were invited to the Radio Times cover party, and I was presented with a, a, a copy of the uh, Radio Times cover which celebrated the 50 years. So it's it, it's a it's a great a great uh, year that, that we've had, and it's wonderful to be here with so many uh, friends. Uh, I say every year it's like coming back to a family reunion because we we've got to know each other all of us over the years, and it's absolutely great. And we've had some wonderful uh, we've got some wonderful guests here tonight. Uh, but sadly, we haven't got John Clegg, who had a fall and isn't able to get, and Harold and Jean Snowden are not able to be here. But we've got Michael, and we've got Jeffrey, and we've got Ronnie, and we have a new one. We've got <laughs> David here. <Yeah. laughs> I'm being reminded. Uh, who are you telling me I've forgotten? <laughs> oh well, yes. I'm sorry. See that show this time. I forget. I forget the lovely ladies we've got here. We've got Judy Jeffrey, and we've got the lovely Linda. So, <laughs> Bobby and uh, Linda were actually in a Christmas show together playing animals, weren't you? <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but that's another story. <laughs> anyway, but what a wonderful evening we had last night. It seems to me that I'm here today with at least half, because we've only got David, we haven't got Jack, uh, but I'm at least half the cast of Dad's Army <laughs> here at the table. I mean, what a wonderful evening it was. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. And thank you to Jack as well. Yeah. Now, uh, that's all I've really got to say. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And uh, I think other people are going to say things now. Okay. <laughs> Okay, can I just um, can I just mention it? Um, Frank has been to every single meeting we've had here for the last twenty years. <laughs> and another good friend to the society and in the stage show, nice man, Ronnie Grange. Said, really, really. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, good looking people. You're lovely, all of you. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for having me. Who's that? Come on. That's it. Really. Thank you, Ronnie. That's lovely. These, these mics are very, very directional, so I'm afraid you have to hold them quite close. Um, we're delighted. Um, following last night, that uh, he was able to stay on for today and uh, join us for our dinner. Please give a really warm welcome to David Benson. Thank you. Really overwhelmed, you know. <laughs> I'm a Dad's Army fan like you since I was a schoolboy and since it was first on, and I never thought I'd be at the table with Frank. And uh, you know, it's like a dream, really. And to cheese. And we'll see you all again. And, uh, I don't know, we, we, we should sing something, Rich. We'll meet again. Don't know where. Don't know where.
Thank you, David, very much. And uh, another regular uh, actor who comes and supports us and done so much with Dad's Army over the years, and a uh, lovely actor, been in all sorts of cross the pay work. Please welcome Michael Nels. <laughs> I don't normally need a microphone, but still. <laughs> I just, uh, before, I, before I start, I just came across this wonderful article in the uh, Permission to Speak magazine. And it says, here it is, um, I would also love to see Michael Knowles reprise his role as Captain Cuts from the original um, who, The Loneliness of the Long Distance run, Runner. Walker. Walker. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful idea of what this was. In fact, it, but it wouldn't work, you know. Not an 80 year old captain in the army would not work. <laughs> and plastic surgery would be, be stretched too far. <laughs> <laughs> but what I wanted to say was um, I was thinking about people who've gone. Someone was mentioned that earlier. Um, people like uh, that you've worked with. And I think recently of uh, Jim Whitfield and then, of course, um, <clears throat> <laughs> but of course, wins the day. It brought me back to um, <laughs> national service. Uh, now, what actually what happened? There was a piece in the uh, in the uh, Radio Times, but that I that I put in. Well, they they asked me to put it in because I should have been in the week before. Therefore, my agent forgot to tell me. <laughs> so there was a piece in the, in the Radio Times the following week with Windsor and I. And, um, what was I saying there? <laughs> oh, yes, as a result of this, someone, a, a, a lady rang up or rang the Radio Times and said, This man served with my father in Libya in the National Service. And she said, could she get in touch with me? And I said, yes. And she, we got in touch. And she said, my father was called Cliff Wensley. And he was with you in Libya doing your national service. And I said, I was happy to say to her, yes, he was. And we were great friends. He unfortunately died 10 years ago. But his daughter was very pleased to know that because he always used to watch the program and say, I know him, I know him. And I'd also, his, his wife was, was thrilled about that. <coughs> you are further on. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> no, it's too much for me. But it took me back to my days in, in uh, national service when we all, it was a mixed bag. We were rich and poor. There were um, grammar school boys and public school boys and grammar school like me and um, people like uh, farmers boys mingling with also uh, uh, people who already got their degrees. We were all put together in this, this thing. We were all sent to a um, training camp and where, where we were given six weeks basic training. And part of this was we had to go before a board and this was the, I was in the RAF, but I, perhaps I forgot to mention that. It was the RAF, and you went before this board, and the officer there was a wing commander, and I always remember what he said. He said, just to see if he was suitable for being a commissioned officer. And he said, I can offer you an educational um, officer, or otherwise it's blood, sweat, toil, and tears. <laughs> So I thought about it and I said, well, I'm sorry, I have to take the blood, sweat, toil and tears because I didn't fancy spending you know, two years stuck in, a, in a, an RAF station in the middle of, say, Lincolnshire for two, trying to teach people to read and write. So what happened was the RAF told me to drive and sent me off to the regiment, RAF regiment in Libya. Where I was a dry, what they call a gunner driver. And when I got there, it was very strange because um, I used to have to drive around all these uh, high ranking officers. And often when they got in, uh, my voice by then had changed, I must point out. My voice had changed. I'd had a lot of execution lessons prior to, I was going to, after that, I intended to go to Raleigh. 
So when they spoke to me, very, which very rarely, they'd say, what school did you go to? And I, I, they probably were thinking, you know, rugby or how to you know, eat them. And I said, oh, uh, Benmo School Grammar School. And they looked at me blankly and never, never said another word. <laughs> but it was, it was a great time there. But, um, we, had, we, mixed, we had a lot of... What, what, what was Oh yes, the yeah, Aria Frenchies. <laughs> oh yes, we, let, we ended up in Libya. Um, so instead of going to a remote um, RAF station in somewhere in the country, I ended up in a remote uh, RAF station in uh, Libya, in the middle of the desert. So uh, it, called, it was called El Adam. And there we used to, uh, our job was basically to uh, defend the airport. But then we had this also, it was just not long after Suez, so we um, we had to sort of patrol the border between Libya and the uh, and Egypt, of course, right down to the, almost to Chad in the, in the south, in this vast... <clears throat> and... <clears throat> what's I doing? No, oh, yes, I must have. We had no sergeant majors. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> we had no sergeant majors in those, but we had warrant officers. Very much the same as, as Windsor was, and uh, you know, spoke very loudly. But this, they would they, they come up to you and say, um, "Did you shave this morning, Evan?" I said, oh, "Yes, sir." I said, "Well, stand closer to the razor next time." <laughs> <laughs> or they come behind you and say, "Am I hurting you, Evan?" I said, "No, sir." Well, I should be. I'm standing on your hair. <laughs> But it was, it was, we were a great bunch, really. We were, all, we were built in, in mainly under campus, and there were about 20 beds and uh, we had a locker each. And, and in the middle, where all our rifles were at, because we never far from our rifles. Yeah. And I must have been a bit pretentious then, because I always used to have on, on my locker a, a complete Shakespeare. <laughs> and <laughs> they often realized that. They do, the men used to come up to me and say, could you write a letter to, to my wife? Because I, I don't know what to say. Or have you got a, a nice poem that you, you could, I could send? And I, so I did this. A few years later, I saw a play called Chicken Soup with Barley, which was in my old Mexico. And this, this was set in national service time. And all these men, were, there was a set in a billet. And these men were asking this chap, can you write a letter to my wife? Or can you send a poem? So I found it extraordinary that it was, you know, I said, that's me. Yeah. You know, it was quite extraordinary. What was the next Oh, yes. <laughs> well, now, the, the, um, we had a very young pilot officer. That's, that's the lowest rank in the army, so pilot officer, well, commissioned rank, that is. And he was put in charge of us, a squad of men. And he, we used to have to plant, as I said, go along the... Into, into the Libyan desert. Just so, at this time, we were looking for um, a remote uh, railway, ra not railway, a remote radio station which would direct the aeroplanes. And <clears throat> I used to, when, I, when he always used to put the map up on the wall and uh, point to it and so forth, I knew he didn't do much about it. So, with my experience in my A level geography, I used to ask him very awkward questions. <laughs> I didn't, he used to fluff it and forget it. And anyway, this same officer took us into the desert and we got completely lost. We ran around for two, two days, two whole days. Luckily, we had plenty of water and fuel, but the food ran out. So we lived apart from, we had, we existed for two week days on tin pilchards and hardtack biscuits. I can never face pilchard again. <laughs> But it was uh, it was an interesting time. I think I was I was looking at officers like this, and uh, it came to me that um, when I eventually got into Urangalor, and it ain't half off my and, and, and Dad's army to start with, I picked up a lot from these officers I met, and I uh, thought when I when I when we when we got to about to the second series of. Um, of, of, uh, it ain't, of it ain't half hot, and we went to Chelsea Barracks, which was the, the home of a very, I don't think it's there anymore, but 
a very smart uh, London regiment, and we were invited into the officers' mess, and uh, they all, all the cast was there, and they all met these officers, and afterwards, um, some of the lads came up to me and said, you know, we always thought you were going over the top. <laughs> But you're exactly as they are. That was a very proud moment. Really, because I felt, I watched them. If I'd become an officer, I would not have had the same view. Because I would have been one of them. I was a person standing up there looking in. So I was able to see their foibles and the way they spoke and the way they behaved. And that was to me in great stead, I must say, when I did all the silly ass officers. <laughs> Dad's army and eventually into it into our partner. So that's my <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, fi finally, um, can I introduce to you to a man, lovely actor who's been in lots of Dad's army, the first TV series. And of course, he was an Adolf Ottman, and I think he did one or two episodes of IDI as well, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome Geoffrey Holland. First of all, what a joy it is to be able to follow Michael, Frank, you know, David and, and Ronnie onto this, this auspicious occasion. Wonderful, wonderful to be here with you all. Um, I wanted to tell you a little story tonight about something that extraordinary that happened to Michael and I and several other members of the cast of You Rang the Lord recently. Now, I go back to 2017 when uh, I got several emails from Hungary, from fans of You Rang the Lord in Hungary. And it wasn't until then that I discovered that You Rang the Lord was actually massive over there. To this very day, they watch it every single day on their televisions. It's in Hungarian, and it's in English, and they love it. They absolutely love it. And I started to get more and more and more emails from these people in Hungary. And when I did my play, uh, you know, this is my friend Mr. Laurel, at the German Street Theatre in the West End, uh, suddenly I got a, a message that there were 30 or 40, nearly, Hungarians <laughs> flying over from Budapest to come and see it. And it just so happened, for them, fortuitously, that Sue Pollard was in the audience that night as well, so they were able to meet her. They all came round to the stage floor afterwards, and then we had a, a wonderful meeting. The following day, we decided to go up to uh, what was used as the Meldrum House in Holland Park Villas, and Michael joined us, Amanda Bellamy came along and joined us. Sue unfortunately couldn't come, but they met her the night before at my show. So I was there, and we had uh, lots of photographs taken outside the house, uh, and the, the owners were looking through the window, wondering <laughs> what the hell was going on in front of their house, in this street. So they sort of came out, they edged their way out into the front, uh, in front of the fence by the gate. And uh, I explained to them, as best I could, why this was going on, and I had the, I had the, the book that, that you've just got, so you, the one you just won in the raffle, the, the companion, with me, just in case I had to explain why. And uh, of course, half of the book is in Rack Lord anyway, and I showed them the, the picture of their house that was in this book, uh, that it had been on television, and they were thrilled. They knew the house had been involved in something on television, but they weren't quite sure what, and I was able to help them and show them give them the ISBN number, and then they put me and bought the book. Now, so they know why their house is famous. But it was, it was quite a, a, a wonderful experience. And later on that year, I was asked to do a radio interview for a Hungarian radio station, uh, and they had a, a, a DJ there that could speak English, sort of, but they had a, also an interpreter there, a member of the production team that was helping him out because he could speak good English. So he interviewed me, and I answered the questions. He answered me the first, it was quite confusing. He asked me the questions in Hungarian, and then the English interpreter asked me the question again in English. I answered it in English, and then they went on, thank you very much, and went on to the next question, because what was going to happen was that that, that interview was going to be um, edited, and the actor 
that dubbed my voice in the Hungarian version of Euranglilo oh, no. would answer my questions. Oh, no. <laughs> it was all very confusing, but they, apparently it was a great success, and they put it together, and it was a huge hit. And, uh, and at the end of the interview, this is uh, 2017, they said to me, what are we going to do next year, this is 2018, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of you making the first episode of Your Ragmalord, which was in 1988. So I, off the top of my head, quick as a flash, said, what if we all come over there to Budapest to celebrate with you? Ah, he said, leave it with me. Leave it with us. And lo and behold, uh, a few months later, we, we had a, a, a message from uh, dear friends who I've just made a little video with our friends Michael and Frank to send to them to say hi, we're all here having a Perry and Croft weekend and having a lovely time. We got some uh, people together uh, trying to organise this amazing uh, you know, convention, if you can call it that, uh, for us all to come over to Budapest to celebrate 30 years of your memory. Amazing. Uh, but they got it together over there in Budapest. They got somebody who's in the media uh, to organise to crowdfund, that's a phrase I'd never heard before, but they crowdfunded it. They asked people to buy tickets to this event and put in money, uh, and they raised an absolute enormous amount of money. And they flew five of us over, five of us, the five of us that were still alive <laughs> and, and still available. Sadly, Perry Benson and Sue Pollard couldn't go because they were working. But Michael and I, and KG Rabette, Susie Brand, and Amanda Bellamy all went over there to, uh, to Budapest for this incredible weekend. We had the most amazing time. And uh, you know, if I could describe one of the highlights of the day for me, particularly, I mean, it was all lovely for all of us. But um, when we got there, it was all very, very secretive. There was an event, there was an occasion, there was a location where it was taking place. Nobody knew. Nobody knew where it was except the people who had paid the money because they didn't want any gate crashers going in. When we got there, we were taken in secret to this huge room in this university building in Budapest. And we were, we were smuggled into the back. And uh, I took with me, thinking it might come in handy, the costume that I wore as James Coltrane, which I bought at the end of the series because I wasn't having anybody else have it. It was mine. So I bought it, I took it home, and I still had it with me, and I took it in a bag, uh, the, the striped jacket with the black sleeves and the, uh, the trousers, and I took it with me, and uh, there was an occasion that actually came up. But uh, the, the, the event occurred, and when we started this, this amazing day in front of cameras and recorders, there were 900 people in that room. 900 of the, of the 20 odd thousand fans of your Lord. In, in Budapest that were there in Hungary itself. And the, the first 40 minutes of the event took place where there was a huge screen on the back wall with all the people sat on the stage in front. The first 40 minutes for the audience that were there were with the, the actors, uh, the Hungarian actors, who had dubbed our voices onto the Hungarian version of the show. And the audience didn't know they were gonna be there. That was a real bonus for them. And what, what happened was that they all took, got up and told a, a story of or a few, you know, their, of themselves into their own audience, in their own language. And there was a wonderful comair on the stage, who was you know, an, an interpreter for us, who spoke both languages, though we, we were all right. And at the end of this first 40 minutes, the last actor to speak and tell his story was the actor who dubbed my voice as James Taltrees in the, into Hungarian. And at the end of what he'd finished, he got a nice round of applause, and then the comrade picked up a little bell and said, I think we'd all like to have a glass of champagne, wouldn't we? I think we've been, you know, we've been, we to deserve one. And she rang the bell, and I walked on, in the costume, with a tray of champagne. They went mental. <laughs> I could have been any member of the Beatles. <laughs> I could have been Elvis Presley. They went ape at the rest. They did. I just couldn't believe it. 
I was completely this wall of sound. I walk onto the stage the best I could. I went up two steps with the tray. I put the tray down on the table. I smiled. The actor who dubbed my voice, his chin was on his chest because he yeah. didn't know I was coming on either. He said, it's Jeffrey Holland. And they went mental again. And then I shook his hand, I smiled, I didn't quite know what to do. I needed to, I, I'd been given a line to say, so I had to quiet the audience, so I, I, you know, I did the best I could to quieten them down. And when they eventually did get quiet, I just went down and said, you rang me, lady? <laughs> they went mental again! <laughs> I couldn't believe this was incredible, it was insane! And, you know, eventually I, I smiled and, and took, left the stage, because there was nothing more for me to do. And I, I walked into the wings, and I just burst into tears. It was utterly, totally overwhelming. The, the love in that room, it, was just, it took me completely by surprise. I had no idea. If you want to see it, it's available on YouTube. Just, just book in, you rang my lord, Budapest. And it's all there. There's a wonderfully edited program, the whole thing. I think they've even got me in tears as well on there somewhere. But it was just so incredible that that program could be so popular today. And I am so pleased. I just think Jimmy and David would have been so proud. Thank you. I love you play, Mr. Laura. I suppose a lot of you must have seen it when I did it here a couple of yeah, years ago yeah. at the weekend. But for those of you who haven't, tough. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a wonderful play. I'm very, very happy with this. Uh, it, it came about quite by chance in a way. It was all meant to fall into place when it did. It's an idea I had when I was a small boy. I was a great big fan of Laurel and Hardy as a small boy. I used to go and see them at the Saturday morning picture shows. Uh, and then, you know, yeah, I fell in love with the two characters, these two silly men doing naughty things, going to get into trouble with authority, like mm -hmm. naughty boys like me did at the time, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so I sort of, you, yes, I did grow up and you move on. Uh, but then it came the 1970s, and I was a, a young actor starting out in my career, in my, in my 20s. Uh, and then BBC Two started to show Laurel and Hardy. Mm -hmm. in, in the evening, about six o'clock in the evening, mm -hmm. you get a Laurel and Hardy film. And, my love for them became rekindled at that time, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, we just got on with them, we just enjoy watching them. I hadn't got a video recorder at the time, because, you know, people didn't have those things then. At the time, I used to put my cassette player near the telly and record the soundtrack so I could play it back and imagine the pictures. You know, it was lovely. Uh, and I thought, at that time, one-person shows were becoming quite fashionable, too. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice to do a one-man show about Stan Laurel, because for me, you know, people, it was a great story to tell about his life and he, you know, the many things that had happened to him in his life uh, that people didn't know about. You know, the, the, he was actually the brains behind the whole act uh, and the whole production of all the films. You know, people didn't know that. They just see this little twit on, on the screen, <laughs> this dimwit, and uh, it, it was far from that. And I thought it'd be a great idea to tell that story. And I thought, well, I can't do it yet, because I'm only in my 20s. I can't do a one-man show about, you know, telling somebody's life story, because you can't tell a life story until you've had a life. So I knew I had to wait. So I put it on the back burner and thought about it for a lot. And I thought, I'm always going to somebody, you have any ambitions, you know, have you gone with it? Yes, I'd like to do a one-man show about Stan Laurel. Oh, that's a good idea. They said, oh, I could see that. Yes, I could see that happening. Anyway, it went on and it went on. And over the years, over the years, and the years went on. Uh, I finally met Judy, landed her, and we talked about the possibility of doing this show. And uh, she used to nag me and say, you, you're on about this show. You know, this, this Stan Laurel show you want to do. Why don't you do it? You talk about it all the time. Would you get up at your backside and do something about it? I said, listen, it'll happen when it's meant yeah. to happen. And I've always believed that. Yeah. You know, I had it in my head, in my heart, in my head, that it would happen when it was meant to. And I truly believe that. And one day, you know, she came to say, you're not going to do it, are you? I said, yes, I am. Just wait. <laughs> so, you know, we, we went on. Time went on. And uh, we reach 2011. We've gone that far. And uh, we meet a friend, a mutual friend, as a charity show, supporting an actress that we knew, uh, and we went to see the show, and in the interval, we met another actress that we knew, 
who was there for the same reason. And like you do, we always say to each other, what are you, what are you doing? Are you busy? Are you working? Because we all like to be busy. Uh, she said, oh, I'm doing this wonderful play. I'm doing this wonderful one-woman play about this horrendous character. You know, it was a, it was a, a horrendous story based on fact about a, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jewish woman who betrayed tens of thousands of her own people to the Nazis during the war in order to survive. It was a vile uh, subject, but it was a fantastically dramatic, wonderful play. And I said, she said, the writing is amazing. And I said, oh, well, I'm looking for a, a writer to help me write a one-man show about Stan Law. She said, oh, she said, well, come and see the play. Come and see the play. Oh, yeah. she, she'll be there this week. You could meet her. So we, we did. We went out to see this wonderful play. And uh, sure enough, in the bar after the show, we met this lady. And I said, she shook hands with her. And she said, you're the man who wants to do the one-man show about Stan Laurel, are you? And I said, oh, she told you, did she? And I said, yeah. she said, yes. She said, yes. When do we start? She said. <laughs> So I thought, here we go, this is it, right. So we got together, we collaborated. She knew who Laurel and Hardy were, but she didn't know much about them. So we collaborated on the, the you know, I gave her all the research that she needed, uh, material that she needed to do. And within two weeks, we got the framework of a play, because when she writes, she writes quickly, and she writes beautifully. She writes stuff the way people speak. She writes in a, in a natural way. Uh, and I collaborated with her, I put, I put in all the comedy, I put in a few anecdotes of uh, the story. Uh, that I wanted in there historically. And uh, when we put this play eventually on its feet in 2013 at the Camden Festival at the Gatehouse Theatre in London, uh, she has set the play. I'd given her free reign to set the play historically where and when she felt it would be best to tell the story. And she set it in the bedroom of a very sick Oliver Hardy just after he'd had the fatal stroke that eventually killed him. He was lying in his bed, unable to move or speak. And she set the play there so that Stan arrived uh, in, you know, as me, arrived uh, to visit this sick man and talk, just talk and reminisce and tell the story about uh, what had happened to them all in their lives and the money they'd lost, the money they'd won, the money they'd made, the women in their lives, of whom there were many, trust me, there were. And, uh, you know, it was just a way of telling the story. And in 2013, no, in, in, sorry, 1956, the first bit, when Oliver Hardy had the stroke, in 1956, where she set the play, Stan Laurel was 66 years old. Now, when we put the play on its feet in the first, for the first time in 2013, Geoffrey Holland was 66 years old. So I turned to Judy and I said, how's that for time? <laughs> you know? So that's how it happened. We're still doing it. I've just come back from a month in Dublin. I've had a wonderful time over there. I've got a few gigs booked in for the rest of the year. But those of you who haven't seen it, do try and catch it. Talk to those who have. They might just persuade you. It's worth seeing. David's seen it. Of course, he has several times. But there you are, Tony. Was that what you wanted to hear? Thank you very much.